Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Robin Hernandez, and I'm the School Meals Access Manager with No Kid Hungry, and I'm joined here by my team. Uh, Janelle's going to introduce everyone in a moment, but I just wanted to uh, let you know we are so excited to be uh, bringing you CEP Workgroup 2.0. It's bigger and better this year, um, and we're bringing you this workshop because we know CEP has always made a big difference in increasing access to meals for kids. Um, but despite all the trainings and resources available, we know there's still a lot of questions uh, and concerns around this whole process of, of going CEP. So that's why we decided to bring you this work group format uh, so you can have some peer-to-peer -peer connection and support. So we want this to be, be your think tank, your, your brain trust, if you will. So let, allow it to be your connection and support system throughout this process. Um, and we know that um, individually we may not have all the answers, uh, but together we can we can solve anything. So thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to um, Janelle Williams Pagan to continue the introductions for us. Thank you, Robin. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, just happy to have you guys here um, for our first workshop. Um, Daisy, can you change to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, for our agenda today, um, we uh, have a couple of great guest speakers. Uh, Katie and Gurdjie will be um, speaking shortly. Um, then you, we will group you guys into an activity. Um, and this is gonna be a little interactive. Um, we're gonna try to make it fun um, and make sure you get as many questions answered um, about CEP. Uh, then we'll go into Q&A. Um, and then a, a short closing. Uh, just highlighting a few housekeeping items. Um, we will only be recording the presentations. We will not be recording the group activity or the Q&A portion um, of today's uh, meeting. Um, if you have any questions, please chat us. Um, and especially during the discussion, we would love for you guys to uh, turn on your cameras um, and get engaged with the group. Um, and participate any way you can. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I just want to introduce all of the um, other staff um, that have been uh, working really hard to bring you this uh, CEP workshop series. Um, I uh, would like to introduce Daisy Munguia uh, Pinon, who's our associate director here in uh, Southern California. Uh, uh, Robin and I were already introduced to you. Um, Tommy Lee, who's our program associate and our tech guru. So if you have any questions, please uh, follow up with him. Um, and then Paige Pernacki, who is um, our uh, amazing associate from the Center for Best Practices. Next slide, please. Um, so I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Katie Dooley Hendrick, who is the Associate Director for Northern California. Um, and she will just be providing you with some uh, legislative updates if we have any. Um, and uh, take it away, Katie. Thanks, Janelle. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with you all today. Um, as <clears throat> Janelle mentioned, I'm an Associate Director for the California campaign here. Um, I wear a number of hats on the team um, and oversee a number of our state uh, statewide partnerships, work out, do a lot of work with the Department of Education, um, uh, CSNA and others. Um, and I also oversee our San Joaquin Valley strategy. So I am um, physically located in Hanford, California, um, just a handful of miles south of Fresno. Um, and I oversee our staff that are, uh, are based in uh, Fresno County and Kern County um, and help them with the strategies around supporting districts and community based organizations in Fresno, Kern, Kings, Tulare, and all the other um, many uh, San Joaquin Valley counties. Um, so as we <laughs> originally had planned, I'm here to provide a bit of an update on um, some of the federal advocacy and legislation that is pending. Um, when we had planned for this, we had hoped to have a bit more of a concrete update for you. And I don't anticipate this being a shock to anybody, but <clears throat> there is very little certainty around um, any federal legislation that may have an impact on um, child nutrition programs specifically around community eligibility. 
Um, some of you may have followed um, in the, all of the conversations around Build Back Better, um, the, <clears throat> the bill that passed out of the House of Representatives did include a number of um, updates and changes, modifications to the community eligibility provision. Um, that bill <clears throat> then headed to the Senate where we have a very little confidence that it would move forward in its current state. Um, so the, the main updates to um, CEP that were included in the bill that passed out of the House were an increase in the multiplier to 2.5, um, a decrease in the threshold, which is currently 40%, the decrease down to 25%. <clears throat> and then this also possibility of statewide CEP. So those were the three modifications, again, increased multiplier, decreased threshold, and possibility of statewide CEP. As I said, we have very little confidence that that bill that uh, was passed out of the House has any possibility of being passed in the Senate the way that it was. That said, there's a number of, there's quite a bit of support around the, the child nutrition components of Build Back Better, and there are some possibilities that it may be include those, those things may be included in a much smaller bill or as we embark on child nutrition reauthorization. So definitely worth keeping an eye on. We will continue to prov provide updates. Um, as as things move and as we hear and as our you know federal advocacy team and any of those conversations glean any insight. Um, but for the sake of this group and for the sake of moving forward in California, where we know we have the universal meals for all um, <clears throat> bill that is law here, um, it really makes sense to kind of plow ahead, full steam ahead with CEP as it currently stands. Um, because there is just very little likelihood that any changes to CEP would be passed or take effect prior to the April deadline for data and or the June deadline for application for CEP for the upcoming year. Um, and as we know, there is no, there's not really a downside to rematching if, or, uh, you know, re applying for your CEP or changing your grouping or whatnot, um, should any changes happen for the following year. Um, so our current stance is that we are still hopeful. We are still working, um, firing on all cylinders on our advocacy front at the federal levels um, and really working to try and um, make some positive um, changes. However, we feel strongly that it makes perfect sense to continue on the path of um, the 40% threshold and all the existing CEP provision um, guidance at this time. Um, so like I said, I wish I had more concrete information to provide you, um, but hopefully that's a little bit helpful. And as I said, we will always um, provide any updates to this group um, and any changes that come about and, and support that we can provide around that, um, we will be available um, to field questions and provide support as needed. Um, Robin, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. All right, thank you so much, Katie, um, for the much needed clarity on um, federal legislation that may affect CEP. Um, so the key takeaways seems to be that districts should not be waiting for a Build Back Better to pass um, before taking action to complete their CEP application. So we appreciate you keeping us in the loop on that. Um, with that, we're going to move to our uh, next speaker. Uh, I know everyone's excited to have joining with us today, Grigit Barea, uh, Staff Services Manager 3 with the CDE. Um, and he's going to be sharing with you guys uh, some universal meals and CEP basics uh, and answer a lot, of, a lot of the questions I know you have as, as far as getting started on this process. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Grigit. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much, uh, Robin and Katie, uh, for having me. Um, uh, good to see everybody today. Um, thanks for taking some time out of your afternoons to uh, learn a little bit more about provisions. Um, if you guys were with us a couple weeks ago for our um, 
Universal Meals kind of deep dive into CEP and provisions, some of this information may be um, a little bit of a review, uh, but um, I did kind of try to slim it down for my 50 minute um, uh, speech uh, last time around and just to kind of uh, cover, you know, the, the main take home topics. So let's see. So by this point, um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the, the three main pillars of those universe, uh, the Universal Meals Program in California. Um, and today we're really going to focus on that, that second pillar, the, the provision participation requirement uh, for those districts that are, that are high needy. Um, so Universal Meals does provide a definition for us for high poverty schools. Um, and a high poverty school is one that is eligible for CEP. Um, essentially, if you if you meet that 40% ISP threshold um, that is required by the federal government to be eligible for CEP, um, then you must apply for a provision. Um, while they're using the CEP um, standard as the threshold, uh, I really, really want to emphasize um, the mandate does not require that you be on CEP. It just mandates that you be on one of the provision programs. Um, in California, we know that CEP is by and far um, the most popular uh, provision option that is used in the state. Um, rough numbers, I think we're up to almost 3,500 school sites that have been approved for CEP. Uh, we have about 800 school sites that operate provision two and provision one and three are um, all but extinct, um, still available, um, still an option, um, but really the benefits of CEP and provision two are far and above uh, provision one and three. So we're gonna focus on those two um, this afternoon. Um, so essentially to, to determine if that provision requirement applies to you, um, the, the simple step that you'll take is you'll calculate your student percentage. Um, the way that the California Universal Meals Bill is written is that the requirement um, to apply for a provision is established at the site level, so individual school sites. Um, if an individual school site has an ISP of 40%, then that school site must apply. Um, to calculate your ISP, it's a, it's a pretty simple uh, calculation. You'll take the total number of students that are enrolled at that school site, um, and identify the total number of students that you have that are directly certified. So that includes, you know, your CalFresh, your CalWORKs, any local level uh, uh, direct certification matching that you're doing, any sibling extensions that you've done can be counted. That directly certified student count, um, do the simple math, multiply by 100 and you'll, and you'll get a percentage. If that percentage is above 40%, then you must apply for either CEP or provisions one, two, or three. If that ISP is below 40%, then that school site is not subject to this, um, to this pillar of the universal meals requirement. However, um, the other pillars still do apply. So if that ISP is below 40%, that school site would um, still have to offer a breakfast and a lunch to all students. Um, and in order to get the additional state meal funding that is available for universal meals, um, you those sites would have to be participating in the federal school breakfast and national school lunch programs. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with CEP, I'll kind of cover some basics, some overview, a uh, little overview um, and what it takes to apply. So um, CEP really was the, um, the USDA's um, one of USDA's options for providing universally free meals to children. Um, CEP is a four-year reimbursement option. So when you're establishing a CEP cycle, uh, you're establishing your claiming percentages for a period of four years. Um, you can apply for CEP either using uh, individual school sites. Um, you can group school sites together to establish a combined identified student percentage, um, or you can even apply for CEP as an entire district if you can meet that 40% threshold. Um, the federal portion of the reimbursement is based off of solely the number of students that are directly certified. So um, if you're a school district that has a low direct certification uh, percentage or um, you rely heavily on meal applications, um, provision two may be a better option and I'll touch on that here shortly. Some of the benefits of CEP, um, you'll never collect meal applications. So as long as you're operating a community eligibility provision, um, there's no meal application um, uh, administration required. Um, 
As a result, you also never have to report um, perform verification. So there's if there's no mail applications, then there's no verification to complete as a, as a result of that. Um, now you still will have to complete some verification reporting requirements, but it is a much much more streamlined process um, than. Um, doing the complete verification process. Um, simplified meal counting and claiming procedures. You know, you're just taking a total count of the meal served rather than having to track individual student eligibility. Um, we know that um, when meals are available universally for free, that uh, participation increases. Um, some of the studies that we've seen done across the nation show that participation can increase as much as 30% uh, when a district transitions from a standard counting and claiming to a uh, universal meals option like CEP. Um, and then specifically under the California Universal Meals Program, going to CEP really maximizes the federal dollars that come in for universal meals. You know, one of the big differences between CEP and provision two is that under CEP, the federal government applies a 1.6 multiplier. Um, so, you know, every, um, every meal that's served under CEP uh, is, um, it basically ensures that there's more federal dollars that come in, which as a result will, you know, ensure that the state funding that is set aside um, for universal meals will go further. So that 1.6 multiplier, that is currently what is set um, by the USDA. As Katie mentioned, there has been a lot of chatter, um, you know, at, in Congress about potential changes to CEP, um, but that 1.6 multiplier is what is currently um, being used. Um, to determine the percentage of meals that you'll have claimed at the free rate, you take your identified student percentage and you multiply it by 1.6. Um, that percentage of meals are claimed at the free federal rate. So those meals will get the full amount of federal free reimbursement. They'll receive the you know, 24 and change, 24 and some odd cents of state meal reimbursement. Um, and then the remaining meals are claimed at the federal paid rate. Um, under the universal meals program in California, all of those meals that even fall into that paid category will all be eligible to be reimbursed at the free rate. So um, what going to CEP does is it helps us to maximize the amount of federal dollars that come in so that the, the financial burden to the state is a little bit lower. Um, at the end of the day, with CEP being set up this way and with the universal meals being set up this way, um, under the universal meals program, essentially every school that participates under CEP um, will be functioning as if they had a ISP of 62 and a half, which would give you the kind of was, you know, historically has been that magic number that everybody reaches for. Um, it'll all meals will be served at free. What'll really just be the difference is where does that funding come from? Does it come from the federal side or does it come from the state side? Um, another area that we have a lot of questions about on um, with CEP as well, you know, if you don't have meal applications, what happens to our LCFF funds? Um, and so schools that operate CEP um, or who are doing a provision in a non-base year, those schools will collect an alternative income form rather than a, a national school lunch program meal application. And that data is utilized specifically for LCFF purposes. Um, our LCFF office does have um, some sample alternative income forms on our webpage. Um, I'll, once I'm done presenting, I can drop a link in the chat for everybody here. Um, we are working internally to uh, do some updates to some of those sample forms. Um, and we're also working currently on refreshing our um, LCFF frequently asked questions. Um, the, you know, the primary takeaway with the alternative income form is that it is a much more streamlined process um, and much less laborious than um, the requirements that are associated with a, 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 a NSLP meal application. Um, however, because those applications are being collected solely for LCFF purposes, right? It doesn't, it's not being used to specifically establish an individual child's eligibility for a free meal. Um, if you're collecting LCFF alternative income forms, those costs must be paid for by the school district's general fund. It's not, um, not to be supported by the cafeteria fund. That's not to say that nutrition staff um, cannot help and support with the collection of those alternative income forms. However, whatever time that 
nutrition staff are putting in should be paid for by the district's general fund and not by the cafeteria fund. Um, as a as a standard rule, because those those applications are not being used for the meal programs, um, they should not have a reference to the nutrition programs on the income form. Uh, we've had a lot of success from school districts that are um, either offering an alternative income form um, electronically um, or who have built it into their registration process. So it's something that uh, parents submit um, as they're registering their children for school for the, for the upcoming school year. Um, and we've heard from districts that doing that has really helped to increase um, you know, the, the return rate of those. Um, you know, one concern that we've heard with the universal meals is, well, if everybody's eating for free, how do we motivate families to submit meal applications? Well, if you can build it into your registration process and use the alternative income form, um, that is a similar way that you can streamline. Um, and actually, before I talk about um, the application piece for CEP, another piece that I want to mention, and, and this, um, when I drop in the resource for LCFF alternative income forms, um, it goes into more depth here. But in the same way that you would establish a CEP base year, you can also establish an LCFF base year. So um, if you were to choose to go to CEP, um, you could do that alternative income application collection once every four years and then use those percentages for that four year period, similarly to how we um, establish a base year for CEP and how that percentage carries. So that's another way um, you know, that the school district can reduce their administrative burdens. Um, in those off years, you can always add more students to your unduplicated count, um, but it gives you a firm baseline to work with um, and helps to reduce that administrative, um, you know, you know, work of having to collect those alternative income forms. Um, so when applying for CEP, um, a couple really important dates. Um, first and foremost, the data that's used for your identified student percentage has to be based off of April 1 of the school of the prior school year. So for the 22-23 school year, that would be based off of data as of April 1st, 2022. Um, you'll want to pull your enrollment lists on that date, right? The, the number of students who are enrolled on April 1st. And then you'll want to pull your direct certification lists that reflect kids that were directly certified as of April 1. So, um, you know, here we put April 7th. That is about the date that the CalPADS data extract will be available. Um, and we know that, you know, oftentimes even with local um, direct certification match processes, so local county offices of um, social services or support services, um, there's typically a couple day lag, right? There, um, by the time the match process is completed and then the results are available, maybe early in April, but that those, the data that is used for that match is reflective of April 1st. So um, in CalPADS, we know the delay, it's, it's a CDE database, um, typically is available between the 5th and 7th. Um, if you have a local list that you know that the match is completed a couple days after the 1st, um, that is acceptable. Just make sure that it's, that it's notated on there that you know, while this data was pulled after April 1st, that it does reflect data as of the 1st. Um, one of the common pitfalls that we have is that um, folks do not save the original extracts in the original data form. So for example, in CalPADS, that's typically, that's in CalPADS, not typically, it is always going to be a text file format. Uh, we've had school districts that will, um, submit to us a list of directly certified students out of their point of sale system. Um, we need to have the source documentation to establish that. So when you're saving those CalPADS extracts, just make sure that you're saving it in an original text.txt um, file. That's how we know that it has, has not been doctored. Uh, when you're submitting that application for CEP, um, there's a number of forms that you'll be submitting to us. Um, the SNP-19 is um, your policy addendum, so that, that's going to cover, you know, your changes to your meal counting and claiming procedures, your outreach, how you're notifying families. Um, the SNP-55 um, is basically your spreadsheet where you're, you're going to show us um, uh, which students that you've identified um, as being eligible. Um, we'll use that to pull a sample and then refer to your original source documentation to make sure that you've calculated the percentage correctly when we do our verification. Um, and then you'll submit to us the SMP 71, which is just an application checklist. Um, you'll sign it, um, you know, making sure, you know, you're certifying that everything you're providing to us is true and correct to the best of your knowledge. You'll include all of your source documents 
So that's going to be your CalPads extract, any local level matches. Um, and then you'll upload those into CNEPS attachments. Um, you know, in this whole work from home world, um, we're, we're transitioning away from mailing those forms in hard copy. Um, and you'll just send an email to our CEP inbox, CEP at cde.ca.gov. Um, and that triggers um, our staff to know that it's ready for, for our review. Those applications are due to us um, by June 30th, um, 2022. Uh, this is a federal deadline. Um, so I know last year there was an extension that was issued under the waiver authority that USDA uh, provided. Thus far, we haven't heard anything um, regarding a potential extension of CEP um, uh, applications. Um, so while it, June may seem very far away, April's right around the corner um, and you know, spending that additional time early in April to to really maximize those direct certification matches will help you to have um, as, as solid of an ISP as possible. Um, the June 30th deadline also really helps us on the CDE side. Our goal is always to complete the verification and validation of identified student percentages for all applicants before school starts. So um, as soon as we get the application into our team, uh, we, you know, our, our programs team will go through the application and ensure that everything that we need is there. If there's anything missing, we'll, we'll contact you to, to clear, clean that up, and then we'll send it over to our compliance team um, who will complete the, the validation. The benefit of us of us validating it on the front side means that when you have your administrative review, there's no benefit issuance um, and certification review as part of it, um, unless you have a standard accounting and claiming site somewhere. Um, provision two is another alternative to CEP. So um, let's say you know you meet that 40% ISP threshold, um, but um, for whatever reason you know you'd, you'd rather use a provision that leans more heavily on meal applications. Provision two really is the option. Um, an alternative also for provision two is that let's say you can't get to that 40%. If you're slightly below 40%. Um, you know, with provision two, there is no minimum standard. So even though that universal meals requirement, um, you know, may not be in play, um, you can still choose to participate in provision two and streamline some of the administration of the national school lunch and school breakfast programs. Um, just like CEP, provision two does require that you're serving meals um, at no charge to all students. Um, but in that first year, you are gonna be establishing uh, what we refer to as your provision two base year. So that first year will look very similar to a standard counting and claiming year. You'll submit, um, you'll send out meal applications, families will submit those. Um, you'll take meal counts by eligibility type, free, reduced and paid each month. Um, and through that, you'll establish a claiming percentage that we then apply per month for the remainder of the provision two cycle. Um, one of the benefits to provision two is that you can actually extend the cycle of a provision two base year um, indefinitely, really, if you have the data to support it. So if you can show that the socioeconomic conditions um, have not improved greater than, I believe it's 5% is the USDA standard um, from the time that you established the base year, then you can extend that provision two um, cycle for another four years. Um, some of the reasons why you might choose provision two over CEP is like I mentioned, if you don't meet that CEP threshold, um, you know, we have heard from some districts um, who aren't quite ready to, um, transition away from meal applications um, to that alternative income form, this does allow you to collect those meal applications um, in that first year. Um, and, you know, it, specifically you've heard that from some superintendents and CBOs. Um, in this world, I'm not sure that a, an alter, a meal application would get a greater return. Um, you know, three years of families not submitting meal applications for, for meals. Um, may lead that to be a challenge, but um, it is a benefit that we've heard from, from some folks, um, or at least a justification for why they've chosen provision two over CEP. Um, the application process for provision two is a little bit more simple. Um, simply, you'll just reach out to your uh, program analysts, let them know that you're interested. Um, there is a simple form that you'll complete and submit to us that just indicates that you intend to establish a provision to base year in the upcoming school year. Um, if you're a school that's operating on a traditional calendar, that deadline is June 30th. Um, if you're on a year round schedule and you have schools that may start earlier in the school year, then that deadline is June 1st. Um, this application though, like I said, is not um, much more simple than CEP. 
you're just indicating to us that uh, that you plan to operate uh, provision two in the upcoming year. Um, and then we'll walk you through the process of, um, of making sure that you're establishing those percentages correctly. Just as with CEP, there will be a validation that's done in provision two. Um, however, this validation is done a little bit further into the year um, to allow time for you guys to collect your applications and establish those percentages. Um, so that really covers um, my presentation for, for today. Um, uh, like I said, I, once I um, stop sharing here, I will, um, I will share a couple links that um, folks have found helpful and um, yeah, I'll kick it back to, to Robin. Thank you so much, Gurji. That was really, really great information. Um, and so at, at this time, um, before we go into our direct Q&A session, we're going to actually uh, go into breakout sessions. So this portion of the call is designed to introduce you to the steps you need to 